if you've got your Bible, open to Luke chapter 7. Because you may think that Jesus only raised one person from the dead, but he didn't. There are several people that he raised from the dead. I actually have a, a very dear friend in the Philippines, Pastor Welly over there, and he told me one day, he said to me, he said, I don't feel like I'm a very good pastor. And I said, why is that, brother? He said, because I've only ever raised one person from the dead. And I went, one? You should be ashamed. That's terrible. No, I didn't. But, but seriously, he, uh, um, he uh, raised a, a baby uh, in his community. Um, one of his relatives, actually, uh, a little baby had uh, died and was died for some hours. And he prayed and the baby came back to life. And every time he gave the baby back to his parents, um, the baby got sicker. And every time he came to the pastor's house, he got better. So he just adopted him. And um, that, that young man today, his name is Nehemiah. I've met him many times. He's a great guy. He's actually pastoring a church. He's actually pastoring the church that we uh, have built for them over there in the Philippines. Isn't that a great story? So uh, anyway, I said, shame on you. Only one. <laughs> All right, I'm zero. All right. <laughs> um, Luke chapter 7, verse 11. Let's listen to our story and then we'll open it up. Soon afterwards, he went to, the town called, to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. And as he drew near the gate of the town, behold, a man <coughs> who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. When Jesus saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, Do not weep. Then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God. Notice all of these miracles glorify God. Yes, they bless up, but they glorify God. All of the miracles we've seen have glorified God in this place. And they said, a great prophet has arisen from among us and God has visited his people. And this report about him spread through the whole of Judea and all the surrounding country. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that as we open this up, up that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, that in this difficult time for our, our community, our country, for the world, Lord, that we will be people of hope, people of truth, people who believe you and trust you. And I ask that you'll speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I'd like to tell you I've been dying to talk to you about death, but I haven't. Um, but it's something that we don't talk about a lot. Have you noticed that? You don't get cards sort of saying, Merry Death, Happy Dying. You know, it just doesn't happen. And it's because it's a bit of a taboo sop uh, topic. We don't talk about it a lot. But this, one, this miracle is a great opportunity for us to talk about the phenomenon that we will all face at some point. Us and our loved ones, unless the Lord returns again, we will all face death. So it's worthwhile us speaking about it, isn't it? Josh spoke about it last week, I this week, so you're getting a double portion. Um, not everyone believes that they, they will die. In fact, there's, um, some people believe they're going to beat death. Did you know there are 27 people that, that I know of around the world that are currently at the Alcor Life Extension Institute in Arizona? 27. These people have chosen to pay $150,000 to be frozen in liquid nitrogen at minus 320 degrees, believing that science will one day bring them back to life. You thought it was cold in this building when you came in, right? Now, if this happens, I'll be the first to say, freeze a jolly good fellow. But um, these people show real fear about what the future holds, and they lack a profound understanding about what death is actually about. So let's have a look at what happened in this incredible miracle and what we can learn. Because what we see in this miracle is a clash of two, two uh, cultures, a, a, a contrast of, of, of two areas coming together in several ways. Let me run through these with you. First of all, there's two crowds meeting. If you look at Luke 7 uh, verse 11, it says, Soon afterwards he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a great crowd went with him. So there's a great crowd going with Jesus. As he drew near to the gate of the town, Behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a considerable crowd from the town was with her. So what you've got here is two big crowds meeting. Clearly, they weren't social distancing, but they were meeting. One, one crowd was, was on their way to the town. The other one was on their way to the cemetery. One, one crowd was full of happiness and joy and hope, and the other was, was full of misery, fear, death, and sorrow. Two very contrasting groups. And the widow and her friends were lamenting the death of her only son. 
and the others were following the only son of, of God. So there's a lot of parallels here. And there are two similar groups today in the world. We've got one fearful, saddened group that is heading to death, to eternal death. And we have another group that's rejoicing, following Jesus Christ, the Savior, into life. So my question to you today and online is, which group are you with? Because you're going to be in either one of those two groups. Are you following the crowd or are you following the Savior? Jesus put it this way in Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide (coughs) and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter it are many. But the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. So you've got a big way, like a big road, and you've got a little tiny road. But he's saying, you know, are you going to follow the crowd with everyone else? Or are you going to meet the Savior? And it comes down to, look, every, every person on earth is going to face death at some point. But every person on earth is also going to face the choice of how they're going to de- deal with it. Where they will spend eternity depends on this choice. So my question is, do you choose Jesus or do you choose the world? The narrow way or the broad way? Life or death? Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 is one of my favorite verses because... The people of Israel are there. Moses puts a bunch of them on one hill, a bunch of them on the other. He said, you guys can represent cursings. You guys represent blessings. And he says, look, I call heaven and witnesses, uh, heaven and earth as witness against you today that I've set before you life and death, blessings and cursings. Now, that's a big decision. That's a decision we all face. What are we going to choose? And then in case you can't get it, he says, therefore, choose life that both you and your offspring may live. You see, God wants you to choose life. Today, you don't uh, don't need to face death with fear or alone. You need to come to Christ and face death with, with the one who has conquered death because you have a choice. If you choose against Christ, you are choosing for death. That's the way it is. So there's two, two great cultures meeting there. There's two only sons meeting. See, Jesus was an only son. Uh, at this point and and so was the widow's son Jesus was the only son of God and this widow's son was an only son and both mothers want the best for their children how many of you mothers want the best for your children all of you right you don't sit around saying gosh I hope my child when he grows up becomes a criminal and a drug addict it's not what you what you want the best for your kids don't you even sinful people want the best for their kids it's understandable everyone wants to see their children reach their full potential Mary did, Jesus' mother. This particular widow did as well. They want to see their children prosper and succeed. You know, I heard about a mum who was a doctor and she left her stethoscope on the back seat of the car and she saw her little girl in the car seat there, picked up the stethoscope and began to play with it. And she got all very proud and said, oh, my daughter's going to follow in my footsteps. She's going to become a doctor. And it was all going well until the child spoke into the instrument and said, hello, welcome to McDonald's. May I take your order? (laughs) See, we, we all want the best for our kids, and yeah, sometimes they don't make the right decisions, but all parents have high hopes for their children, and this widowed mum was no different. She wanted the best for her son, and it was wrapped up in her future as well. See, her son was her only means of provision. In ancient Israel, there was no superannuation, no old age pension, no Medicare, and no one cared for her as she grew old. Her destiny was intertwined with her son when he died her dreams and hopes died with him shattered by the premature death of her son so as this miracle sets up not only do two crowds meet but two only sons meet warren wearsby said this one alive but destined to die the other dead but destined to live there's a lot of parallels the third thing is two sufferers meet on this day two sufferers met the widow was broken hearted she was mourning in despair without hope And the other was Jesus, who was described, and we sang about this morning, as a man of sorrows. That comes from Isaiah 53, verse 3. It says this, He, meaning the Messiah, was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So what does that mean? If you're going through a hard time, let me tell you that Jesus understands what you are going through. doesn't matter what it is. I know he understands you. The Hebrew word for sorrow is man of sorrows. The Hebrew word is makob, which means sorrow, affliction, physical or mental pain and grief. So whatever you face today, physical, mental pain, fear, anguish, grief, you don't have to face it alone because Jesus has been there before you and he understands. 
Now, we are all supposed to be wearing masks in church. And I think this finish, does it finish this week? Next week? This coming Friday, we're allowed to take our masks off. And you're all, you're all complaining about it, aren't you? Wearing, I know I am, wearing masks in church. But folks, let's be honest, we've been wearing masks in church for a long time, some of us. And the reality is, we've come to church and we paint on a happy face with a big smiley thing on it. Have you seen those masks with big smiley faces on the outside? Right, that's what we're like. We come to church smiling, happy, even though inside things are going badly and we feel terrible. We mask our true feelings, our pain, our struggles when we meet others. We don't want to be a burden to others. We don't want them to see us as, as not coping. And so one of the great, you know, I guess hypocrisies, if you like, of church is that we turn up and smile, even inside when we're hurting. If you are suffering today, I want to encourage you to get rid of the mask, not that mask, but, you know, the other one, and open up with someone and share the load with them. See, it's okay to hurt. It's okay to struggle. And we are here as a church to share your burdens with you. Galatians 6 verse 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so, so fulfill the law of Christ. See, Jesus, when he looks at you, he is filled with compassion. Last week, Josh shared with us the, uh, the verse in John 11 verse 35, Jesus wept, the shortest verse in the Bible. You might remember that. But the thing I notice here is that Jesus also has compassion for this poor widow. In her culture, without a husband and without a son, she had no future. She was the lowest of the low, without hope and without provision. And in Luke 7, verse 13, it says this, When the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said to her, Do not weep. Now, the Greek word for compassion here is really interesting. It's the strongest possible word you can use for compassion. Uh, the word in Greek is splachnizomai. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right. Any Greek scholars here let me know. But it means to be moved to the point of your bowels yearning. Now, I know that sounds a bit gross, um, but in Greek, the bowels were considered to be the center of love and pity. And so what it means is Jesus looked at her and he had this, we'd describe it, I guess, as a gut-wrenching compassion for her. He looked at her and he, oh, his, his, his bowels were, were, you know, wrenched, if you like. So whatever you're feeling today, Jesus doesn't just say, oh yeah, pity you, poor you. He hurts with you. He, he has this gut-wrenching response, this, this really deep inner response. He loves you, no matter what you're going through. He, he, whether it's the loss of a loved one, the loss of your home, the loss of a career, a friend, whatever it is, Jesus feels your pain and relates to it. He not only cares, but he agonizes with you. He loves you that much. Psalm 103 verse 13 says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. And 2 Corinthians 1 4 says, This God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which he, he, we ourselves are comforted by God. A lot of comforts in there. But what he's talking about is God comforts us and we're able to comfort others. We're able to t sort of tap into this well of compassion that he has for people and we can feel it in our soul as well. So many people suffer ab abuse, fear, hardship, loss, and they feel like God has abandoned them. I'm telling you, he has not abandoned you. He is right there with you. He's just waiting for an invitation. Whatever you are going through, he is there with you ready to lead you, guide you, comfort you, and care for you. See, at the end of the day, Jesus cares about you. Some of you don't feel this, but whatever you suffer, whatever pain you are going through, he cares, not because of what you can do for him, but because you are precious to him. It doesn't matter if you're dirty, if you're sinful, if you're uh, despised, divorced, physically, mentally challenged, in despair, if you're without hope, God sees you as valuable. What is this? A $5 note. How much is it worth? Not much, <laughs> admittedly. But it is worth $5, yeah? Okay. So what about this? What's it worth? $5, right. What's it worth? 
<laughs> yeah, ten dollars because I because it's squashed. Yeah, it's worth five dollars. This is worth five dollars, no matter what we do to it, because its value is not in the condition that it's in. Its value lies in what its value is. Some higher authority called the Reserve Bank of Australia tells you this is worth five dollars. Doesn't matter what condition it's in, doesn't matter what you do to it, it's worth what it is worth. Well, I'm telling you, Jesus looks at you and he says, You are precious. Doesn't matter what you've been through, doesn't matter what pain you've had, doesn't matter if you've been spat out by the world and chomped on by the world, you are precious and he loves you and you are worthwhile. You have worth and value. When you come to Jesus, yes, you're safe, but you have eternal life. And even more than this, God adopts you into his family. 1 John 3 verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. We are children of God. We are his kids if we come to him and he loves us. So let's figure it out. He's the king of kings. That makes you what? A princess or a prince. You are royalty. <clears throat> Some of you here need to hear this. Don't live like a pauper. Don't act like a vagrant. You are a prince or a princess. Live that way. You don't see princes and princesses down in the gutter getting, getting dirty or, you know, out in the garden swilling stuff around. They're beyond that. They're princes and princesses. They're royalty. They have intrinsic value because of the family they belong to. And so do you. If you belong to the, to the family of God, you are a prince or a princess and you should act that way. Isaiah 61 verse 3, God says, I give them beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they might be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. You are planted in his family and he loves you and you have intrinsic value because he loves you. No other reason, nothing you can do. Nothing you can achieve, you are valuable because God says so. Amen. And you're part of his family. So today, whatever you're going through, God has a gut-wrenching compassion for you and he also has a plan for your life and he has not abandoned you despite what you might be feeling. A clay pot sitting in the sun will always be a clay pot. It has to go through the white heat of a furnace to become porcelain. So don't see your pain as oppression, oppression. See it as opportunity to mature and to shine for him. The fourth big clash that went on in this, <coughs> possibly the biggest of all in this, this miracle, is that two enemies met. That day on the road between Nain and the cemetery, two enemies met. The boy was experiencing death and decay already. But Jesus was all about life and resurrection. Death and life are opposites and they're enemies. Luke 7, 14 says this, And he came up and touched the bar, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. So what we're seeing right now across the world, right at this moment in time, is the fear of death on a scale that you've never seen before. Am I right? Certainly in my lifetime. I've not seen so many people running around so predisposed with this thought that we could be in danger of death from a virus. All the news bulletins are full of information on the virus. All the, all the, uh, um, you know, all the legislation and stuff going through is all based around this particular virus and the possibility of death. Now, if you look at the figures, the possibilities are very low, but it has, the, the fear factor is there, isn't it? And like most things in fear, it's all, the fear is actually worse than the reality. The fear is actually worse than the, the reality. And death... Death is fearful. When we look at it, we, we don't like to think about it because it, br it brings us fear. We're, all of us, I believe, are uncomfortable with us. Science can't tell us what goes on beyond the grave. We don't really know for sure uh, at what's happening behind the veil. I heard about a godly man whose wife was, was dying of cancer. And as he was nursing her, he asked her this question. He said, what's it like to wake up each day knowing you're dying? And she replied, what's it like to wake up each day pretending you're not? Because we will all face this. One of the great certainties other than taxes is dying. And we will all face this. I have asked uh, Dr. Colin Dix to come up here. And um, he's a man who deals with death every day in his profession as an uh, oncologist. 
And I've asked him to come up and share his perspective. He's written an incredible book. If, if you haven't seen it, it's over there. You can pick it or over here. You can pick it up somewhere. Um, but uh, he, he's someone who deals with this exact problem every single day. And I've asked him to come up and give his perspective on death and what happens next. Come on up, Colin. Put your hands together for him. Thank you, Darren. Thank you. Darren is a man of faith. He asked me to speak for five minutes, and that takes incredible faith for me to, to, to limit this to five minutes, a topic that I, that I love talking about. So <clears throat> when it comes to death and dying from a medical perspective, um, we need to talk about a thing called lifespan as biological beings, having a physical body, having cells, DNA, proteins, carbohydrates, made up of uh, flesh and blood for that matter. And in terms of flesh and blood, I've got bad news because we have a lifespan. We've got a beginning and we've got an end. It's going to come to an end. And one of the ways, there, there are a lot of theories about why we die and how long we live. But most people, if they're lucky, get to 80. And if they're really lucky, they get to 90. And if they're really unlucky, they get to 100. Because in this, in this process of our life, um, things go wrong. And it's all related to our DNA. It's the way we put together. Um, if you think of your shoelaces, look down at your shoes if you've got shoelaces. Our DNA in a cell that divides, it can divide once and twice and repair itself and three times. But when it gets to about 50 divisions, it can't do it anymore. And every time a cell repairs or divides, it's like a shoelace that just gets trimmed by that little cap at the end, that little hard bit of the shoelace. And eventually we run out of DNA. We run out of, we run out of lifespan. We run out of space with um, our biological bodies. So we've got a lifespan. We've got a best before date. We've got shelf life. It's not great news. So that's the first thing I wanted to say about um, life is that none of us get out of this alive. We've all got a time frame. The second thing I want to talk about is what exactly is death? Have you ever tried to define what death is? Have you, if you've seen something dead or, you know, maybe in a pet or family member or something dead, what, how do we define death? This is a very difficult thing to define. What is it? For me, the easiest way to define death is to say it's the opposite of life because it's easy to define life. We know things are alive when you can poke it and prod it and it moves. It responds to stimulus. So anybody who's done first aid knows the first thing you do when you get up to someone who's collapsed is you go and shake them, pinch them, you do something to them, and if they move or respond, you know that they're alive. There's hope. Something's going on. And in our lives, in our physical bodies, we've got this sense that whatever we, whatever pokes us or prods us, even to the point where you're in a coma, is that there's a little signal in your brain saying breathe, and it says to your heart, your heart must beat. And we've got this stimulus. And at this, when we don't respond anymore, when nothing can make us respond anymore, we can then with confidence say, the person has died. This creature has died. This biological entity has died. So we get to live all our lives till we can't respond to anything anymore. And at that point, it's easy. Even, even the um, most uh, unwitting person would say, this, this is dead. This is no longer alive. There's no response. So those are things I want to say about death. From a medical perspective, it's going to happen. Our biological bodies are not going to last. It's depressing news. It's not great news at all. So how do we, how do we get around this? Well, we need to look at the scientific evidence about what happens when we die. And science doesn't really help us with that because the process of science is to say, look, I've got a, th I've got a theory. I've got this thing that makes sense. I'm going to measure some, I'm going to measure data. I'm going to say, look, I have this theory that we live after, after we die. How am I going to measure spirituality? But we don't have a way to do it in science. It's bad science to say there's nothing that happens after this life because we can't measure it. It's good science to say we can't measure it so we can't draw a conclusion. So I, we can't really rely on our science to tell us what happens when we die. But there's lots of other stuff we can rely on. We can rely on all the myths and legends that have happened. The pharaohs didn't build those big pyramids because they were bored. Uh, they did it because they had a belief in the afterlife. Uh, if we look at all the religions in the world, it doesn't matter of the 2,500, uh, they say that uh, at the end of this life, 
we continue to exist. We have an accountability. There's going to be a reward and punishment system. And whatever, whatever we look at to say what happens after this life, we, you may be skeptical and say, I don't believe any of that. So why don't you ask someone that's died? And there are two people I want, to, I want you to talk, uh, talk about. And one is George Foreman, the heavyweight boxer, or if you don't know him as a boxer, the grill king. George Foreman died. He was a bit of a rogue. He was in a boxing match. He, he cheated. It was like this um, throwing the game, gambling with the fight he lost. And in the changing room, he died. And he went down to what he described as hell, as a place of torment. And he cried out to Jesus. And he describes in his book this big hand that came down and grabbed him and pulled him out of this, this place of torment. And his um, life was changed. He, became, he came out of that as a Christian. And the other one is the Dr. Mary Neal. She was an orthopedic surgeon. She wasn't a, um, a person with a psychiatric disorder. She's an orthopedic surgeon. She went whitewater rafting. Her boat got caught in rapids and she died. And both these people tell us when we die, our spirit leaves our body. That means that we do have a spirit and that at that point we get to meet with Jesus. So you can meet with him when you die. We're all going to meet with him when we die. Or you can meet with him today and live with him for the rest of your life and make it pretty easy but I guess that sums up maybe more than five minutes but that's as much as I need to say about death and dying it's not a permanent problem death uh, if you believe in Jesus yeah, thank you. thanks Colin thank you for that I, I've asked Colin uh, he's uh, re-releasing his book in a little while I've asked him to come and share further on that in one of our church services is that good because it's a really important topic but he just said at the end there death is not a full stop it's a comma it's not the end. It's a hiccup along the way. Um, those of you may have heard me share on this before, but if you haven't heard, I want to tell you what happened in my life. I suffered an uh, anaphylactic shock. I'm allergic to seafood and, um, well, shellfish rather, not seafood, shellfish. And um, that's why I've given up my shellfish ways. And uh, I, sorry, couldn't resist that. Um, but I'm allergic to, to shellfish and I actually had... Um, uh, an incident where it's, the salicylates is actually what I'm allergic to. And I actually was rushed to hospital and um, I actually died on the, the table while they were trying to resuscitate me for quite a while. And um, I experienced, and so I believe 100% uh, what Dr. Colin has said up here. So I experienced, I actually felt, I was on a, on a, on a kind of a, um, a bed and I actually fell through the bed. You might say, ah, oh, you're going down, that's bad. But um, it wasn't. I f it felt like I fell into the arms of Jesus. And I just remember I couldn't see him, but I was surrounded by light and like liquid love. And it was just, it was an amazing feeling. And then he spoke to me and he said, your job's not done yet. And he pushed me. And I could, while I was there, I could look down this kind of big tube and I could see them operating on my body up the top. And then I kind of floated back up. And the next thing I know was happening all around me. And I said, what just happened when I could, could speak? And they said, you actually died uh, for, for quite a while. And then we, we kept working and we brought you back. So I believe there is something out there. Do you? Yes. And if you don't, are you prepared to take the chance? Because as, as Colin has said, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. There's a lot of people who report something like that. That's what it was like for me. And I believe in life after death. I've seen it. I've experienced it to a small degree, but I can tell you I was surrounded by love and security. I was not fearful. I was, it was a joyous thing. And if you die in Christ or if people you love die in Christ, rest assured that there is joy, Amen. not pain and, and sorrow and all that. So there is joy. If you're not a Christian, you don't get that because you don't know him. Jesus gave his life to give you life. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. He's come that we would have abundant life. The life Jesus speaks of lasts for eternity. It starts right now, but it lasts for eternity. But it starts right now. You don't have to live in death until you die. It's not pie in the sky when you die by and by. It's for right now, and his power is real. And you can live a life of abundance now that lasts into eternity. He purchased your life by giving his. He experienced death that we might have life. And as he gave life back to this widow's son, 
In the same way, he can take the broken pieces of your life, no matter what you've done, no matter who you've hurt, no matter what sin you've committed, he can take the broken pieces of your life and put them back together and give you life abundantly. You don't have to live with what you have done. You can bring it to him and be forgiven. The most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. There it is. <clears throat> Are you facing death? Then this verse speaks into your situation. Light into the darkness of death. And let's face it, we're all facing death. But knowing Jesus takes away the sting of death. Um, Jess shared on this when she did communion the other week. The sting of death, well, 1 Corinthians 15, 55. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, if you have sin, if you entertain sin in your life, there comes with that fear of death. But when you yield that to him, then you begin to understand that he has that death is not a full stop, it is a comma, and you move on into eternity. Jesus gave by, uh, life back to this boy, and he can do the same for you. See, Jesus Christ did not die to, ba to make bad men good. He died to make dead men live. He came to bring life, not just make you better. He came to bring life. John 5, 21. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. And I'm telling you right now, if you can hear my voice online in the overflow in, the, in this room here, I'm telling you, he wills that you have life. He wants you to have life. The son gives life to whom he wills and he wills you to have life. And his life lasts for eternity with him. But it starts now. So let me ask you, is your marriage dead? Is your career dead? Is your family dead? Jesus came to give life and life to the full. And that means life for your marriage, for your family, your career, everything else. This young boy <coughs> that Jesus raised from the dead, there's no uh, record of what he experienced or what he said as a result of that. But I can tell you with great confidence that sometime later, 20, 30, 40 years, 50 years, whatever, that boy died. He still experienced death. And so... Jesus raised him to life, but ultimately his body, as Colin has said, ceased to, you know, ran down and ceased to be for whatever reason. But if you come to Jesus Christ, your soul lives on. When I look at you, when I look into your eyes, I don't just see, I'm an optometrist. I look at eyes all the time, all right? But I don't see your eyes when I look at you. I see your soul because behind those eyes, is a part of you, your spirit, that is going to live forever. And we want you to live with us in heaven forever. Reinhard Bonnke was once interviewed. They said, what's your main aim in life? He said, my main aim in life is to get to heaven and to take as many people as I can with me. And that's mine. That should be yours too. Listen to Romans 8, 11. <laughs> if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. See, the key is not whether you can recite something or whether you go to church every week. The key is, does his spirit live within you? That's the question. Does his spirit live? That's what it says. Look at what it says. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So this is not about, you know, asking you to be a good person or anything like that. This is what we see in this miracle is that Jesus has the power to give life and he wills to give it to you. So I'm going to pray. If you've never asked Jesus into your life, we want you to join us in heaven we want you to join us in eternity. We want you to have life, life to the full now, but life right into eternity. He stands at the door and knocks. This is based on a, a famous painting, but what you'll notice about the door is there's no handle on the outside. Why? Because it's on the inside. 
Only you can open that door. He's not going to barge in. He's not going to kick it down like the SWAT team. He is knocking. And right now he's knocking into your life and saying, hey, let me in. Let me in. He wants to give you life. So you face a choice this morning. Life or death, blessings or cursings, now choose life. Would you bow your head? Let's pray together. If you've never asked Jesus Christ into your life, either here or online, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that because all of us, if we're honest, are fearful of death and what that involves. All of us face death. We know that. (coughs) But you don't have to face it alone. All of us have to be open to what God is doing and he will give us life. So I urge you right now, just search your heart. If you've never asked Jesus Christ into your life, then now is a great opportunity to do it. Just pray these words after me and we can do it together. Just say these words. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I've sinned. I know that I'm destined to death. But right now, Lord Jesus, I ask you into my life as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. And let me live a life that is pleasing to you. If you prayed that for the first time, I'm going to ask you wherever you are, just slip your hand up very quickly and put it down. Good. Are there any more just quickly before we move on? Can't see you all online, so I'm guessing there's a few out there as well. But for those of us who are believers, we claim to know Christ. We claim to be believers. But so many times... We live like we're not. We don't live like royalty. We don't live like people of value. We just go through the motions. We're no different to everybody else. And I believe that the life that Jesus promised, life abundantly, starts now, right now. And some of you are not living that life. You want to live that life. You want to be victorious. You want to be victorious over sin. You want to see God move in your life and it's not happening. I'm telling you, he's in the miracle business and he's looking right at you now and he's saying it's time for you to come home to him. So just keep your heads bowed, your eyes closed. Let's pray together. If you've drifted far from him, if you've wandered far, this is your moment. This is your moment to choose once again life. You may have chosen it before and lost your way. Choose life this morning. Not just life when you die, but life abundantly starting right now. Just pray these words with me. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sin. I choose life this morning. I place my life in your hands. I yield it to you. And I say, have your way. Oh, I tell you, he has a plan and a hope for your future. He is the center of it all for you. He is, he is right there with you. So why don't you just, uh, just keep your head bowed, keep your eyes closed. And we're, we're just going to worship the Lord as we finish this service. If you prayed that prayer, I believe it's a life-changing moment for you right now. Just spend a few moments with him.